Hey, I want to welcome everybody in Claremont. I'm hanging out with White River Junction. Can we give it up for our Claremont family? Yes, we love you guys. We love you. And uh, Pastor Tom, you're doing an amazing job there in Claremont. And all the team there, I know uh, it's, it's a labor of love, isn't it? When you uh, lead a church and when you're a portable location, as you have been for five years. And I'm so proud of you guys. It's, you guys, have, you're doing it. And I'm really proud of you. And I want to welcome our online community. Thanks for hanging out with us. I hope you come and join us in person someday. I promise you it's much better in person than sitting on a screen. Now, we're in this series that we've been kind of going through the whole year. It's bold. It's our, it's our whole vision, if you will, for 2023. We want to be bold. We want to declare who we are in Jesus, and we want to live in a bold way. And throughout this series, we've covered a variety of of topics and a variety of issues that are all uh, filtered through Scripture. And today, we're going we're gonna to talk basically about one of our values here at Riverbank Church that really comes down to an important topic that is affecting everybody in this room, in the theater, and online, anybody watching this or in, in, in the room, this is impacting you. So the value that, that I want to really springboard off of is that Riverbank Church is a generous people. We are a generous people. As a matter of fact, we go so far as to say we are crazy generous. We're crazy generous in that we recognize what, uh, what's ours is really not ours. It's his. So whatever's in your bank account, whatever is in your investments long term, whatever stocks that you have aren't really yours, they're his. And because of that, we're crazy generous. And with that said, I want to talk to you for the next two weeks about finances because the truth is this is a pressing issue in many people's lives right now. As a matter of fact, just in the past two to three weeks, the reports, the economic reports have been coming out. As you know, every quarter there's a government report on the economy. And then what happens is all the really smart economists evaluate it and come to the conclusion that, wow, we're really a mess. <laughs> and so I wanted to unpack those and remind you because you're like, oh, do you really need to? Yeah, I think it's important because this is the truth about where we are as a culture and as a nation that since 2020, in the last three years, and of course there's been a lot of upheaval and a lot of shifts and changes in our country specifically, but according to these reports that gas prices are up 57% in three years. That's a lot. You start feeling it, don't you? You start feeling it. Mortgage rates are up 167%. So if you're in the process now of purchasing a house, I got to tell you, you compare it to my mortgage rate, my interest rate, I'm doing a lot better than you are, right? And, and it's really hard if you're trying to purchase a house. A lot of the younger generation are wondering, are we ever going to be able to purchase a house? Grocery prices are up 15%. And for those of you who do grow grocery shopping, you're like, that's it? <laughs> it seems like a lot more, doesn't it? Of course, the electric rates are up 15% as well. And, and we're not even talking about the, a variety of fuels that are up as well as we face winter and heating our homes. And then, of course, I haven't even mentioned, go out to eat sometime. Not only are the prices insane, but they're even including tips in there. That's a little COVID thing, right? There you go. Hey, we'll give you an extra 20, you know, add an extra 20% for me, right? And we want to take care of people, but it just seems like uh, it's a little over the top. It seems like it's stretching. It, and watch this, as much as everything is increasing and as much as it seems like the world is it's just becoming more and more pricey, people aren't making more along with those rates. So you're not catching up. So maybe you're here today, you're in Claremont, you're watching online and you're like, yeah, man, you're kind of, you're speaking it here. I feel this because overall in the last three years, the U.S. dollar has lost 17% of its purchasing power, and that's why you feel it. Inflation's real. And so the financial conversation that we're going to have today, I think, is in, impacting a lot of people. I know it's impacting us. You, you, look at, you look at your budget, and you're like, holy smokes. Okay, we've got to make some adjustments here, right? But life is just more expensive than it's ever been, yet most of us aren't making more. 
and it's becoming a real thing. And, and it's not going to go away, by the way. But it's important to remember, this is such a crucial thing, that money and material cannot give eternal life. And money and material are not a true meaning in life. So as much as this stuff can strain us and stretch us and pull at us, we can't let it own us. We can't let it own us in our hearts and our minds. Why? Because we're followers of Jesus. And that's really what I want to talk about today, is that you and me, as a launching pad, as a foundation, I think it's important that we remember our identity in Jesus first. Before we really get into the financial thing, and here's what I want to go practical. I want to give you some practical biblical tips on how to spend because in a time when our money isn't going as far as it should, the Bible has a lot to say on how we can spend in a way that honors God. But before we get there, I think it's really important that we drill down on our identity. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, well, there's certain things that are worth us unpacking as a reminder and foundation before we get to the tips on spending. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about it. As a matter of fact, half of Jesus' parables deal with how you spend resources and what you do with them. Uh, 10% of the whole New Testament, 10% deals with how people manage the finances and how they spend and what they shouldn't spend and what you should invest in and a variety of areas in which we conduct our spending. In Scripture in total, Old and New Testament, there are over 2,000 verses on the subject of finances. So the Bible has a lot to say about it, and the Bible can be a helpful resource for us. But again, I think it's important that we remember that we are followers of Jesus, and we have an identity, and that identity should be the foundation at how, from where we spend from, from the foundation of everything in which we conduct ourselves financially. So how we relate to money, I need you to hear this, how we relate to money determines how we relate to God. How you relate to money and how money spent, this, you, how you, it's made, where it's invested, all those things is really connected to how you relate to God. And that's why I really want to kind of jump down on this idea of identity. So first of all, this identity truth, it starts in 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, you're going to turn to 1 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. And this again, this is foundational. We're going to quickly go through this so that we can get to the really good stuff, okay? So look at your neighbor and say, okay, we're going to get to the good stuff in just a few minutes. But this is all foundation, okay? This is all foundation. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, a little background. Peter as you well know, is one of Jesus' guys. He's one of his kind of inner three best friends when Jesus walked the planet. Now, Jesus at this point has been, been gone a while. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. Peter is, is uh, basically uh, a pioneer of the faith, and he's writing a letter later in his life to a bunch of churches around the Mediterranean. This, this letter that he writes is uh, to a bunch of Christians like you and me in the Mediterranean 2,000 years ago. And he's writing specifically to Christians in, in the vein of persecution and trial and suffering and crisis because that was the reality of Christians 2,000 years ago. Life was a much harder life than it would be for Christians in Western uh, American culture. You think you have it hard now? Uh, you need to do a little history and a little bit of lessons in history, especially Christians uh, historically. And that was what was going on here. The Christians that Peter is writing are going through a difficult time. And what he does is he writes a letter reminding them of a few things. And so these reminders are identity reminders. So let's pick it up. Verse 4, Peter writes this, we have a priceless inheritance. Everybody say priceless inheritance. If you have your own Bible, you should underline those two words. We have a priceless inheritance. He's speaking to the identity of a Christian. You have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. The first reminder that Peter has for Christians here as an identity, this is a huge reminder that we have an eternal inheritance. You have an eternal inheritance, Christian, meaning uh, maybe you have a bank account here. Maybe you have a, a 401k and you're like, yeah, that's my inheritance. That's, that's my, what I have looking forward to when I retire. And, and I'm even 
storing up some things for my kids to leave in as, as an inheritance. Or maybe my parents have left me some things as an inheritance. Well, I love that Peter says, well, that's not really what it's about for us, Christian. It's about our eternal inheritance. Our eternal inheritance was bought by Jesus Christ, the greatest investment in the history of the world. Jesus died on the cross, paid for our sins, and in doing so, when he resurrected from the grave, he secured for all those who believe eternity in heaven. And we have an eternal investment, an eternal inheritance, and that is found in heaven. Amen? That is a big part of the identity of a Christian. We have an eternal inheritance that will not corrupt, will not, will not disappear, will not have a bad day on the stock market. Amen? Our inheritance is not changing or corrupting. Our inheritance is eternal. Whereas our earthly inheritances are uncertain, aren't they? Our earthly inheritances are not dependable. Our earthly inheritances have loopholes and are never guaranteed, whereas our eternal inheritance has a perfect condition. It never corrodes. It never cracks, decays, and is tarnished, free, and guaranteed eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have an eternal inheritance. Let's pick up in verse 13, 1 Peter. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Everybody say self-control. Exercise self-control. I love that Peter says this. Put, on, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So another uh, mark of our Christian identity isn't just that we have an eternal inheritance, but we also exercise self-control. This is a marker of a Christian, of a follower of Jesus. We exercise self-control. Peter declares it. We should exercise this. To those reading this in Peter's time, they had people trying to eliminate their jobs because they were Christians. People were trying to kill them because they were Christians. People were trying to eliminate uh, relationships because they followed Jesus. And I love that Peter says, remember that you are a follower of Jesus and your identity, because of that, you have self-control. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, you have the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you. And his spirit gives self-control. There's a fruit of self-control. And so as followers of Jesus, part of our identity Instead of being controlled by outside circumstances, a good day on the stock market or a bad day at work or I don't feel like I'm getting paid enough or I don't have enough in the bank or it seems like the economy is spinning out of control, we have self-control because we have the Spirit of God living in us. It's a marker of a Christian, of a follower of Jesus. It's one of our identity pieces. It's who we are. Verses 17 and 18, Peter continues on. He says, and remember that the, hev that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your lifetime here as temporary residents. Everybody say temporary residents. I want to I comment really quickly on this because some of you are probably looking at something and saying, so he will judge and reward you according to what you do. He's speaking to Christians. This is not an eternal uh, judgment. This is, a, a, there are different types of judgments. And for Christians, we're all going to be judged by our good deeds. That's just part of it. And this isn't the time for me to get into the judgments, but I want you to understand that this is speaking to Christians, okay? And it's not about eternity. It's about judgments based on who we are in our identity. And one day you're going you're gonna to stand before the Lord and you're going to be judged based on the goodness and the deeds of your life. You good with that? Watch this. Verse 18, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. 
I love what Peter says here. He says it's not just that we have self-control. It's not just that we have an eternal inheritance, but he reminds them right here that you and me are temporary residents, that this is all temporary, that we are actually, we are heavenly citizens. We have a citizenship in heaven. This is not our home. This is This is super foundational for those who identify as followers of Jesus. This is our identity. And so knowing that these are marks of our identity, that we are citizens of heaven, we should exercise self-control through the power of the Spirit, and that we have an eternal inheritance, our identity, I need you to hear this, our identity should therefore reflect how we spend the money that God has provided for us. And so the question I want to pose to you today is this. Is your spending reflecting your identity? You are a follower of Jesus. Does the receipt pile, does your bank statement reflect your identity? And so that's what I want to talk to you today about is spending. Knowing that you and me were followers of Jesus and we have an identity that is not tied up in this world. And it has self-control through the Holy Spirit. How can we spend? How do we spend biblical tips to spending? Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. If we're going to spend biblically honoring God, you need to first of all focus on contentment. Focus on contentment. We need to learn to be content with what we have. Again, this comes back to identity. My citizenship's not here. Whatever I have, is, it's temporary. It's going to burn up. Last year, I got a big dumpster. I couldn't believe we filled it up from our basement, from junk that we acquired. And it's burned up and probably in the landfill in Lebanon, New Hampshire right now. And that's all of our stories, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. This is all temporary. And when we spend, we need to focus on contentment. Let me read a scripture from Philippians. Paul says this, Not that I was ever in need, For I have learned to be content with what? With whatever I have. Now, I want to give you quick context here. Paul is writing the Philippians from a really desperate place, and he's writing to people who've supported him financially. And he's thanked them. He's let them know, I'm so thankful for you, but I want you to know, but I've learned to be content no matter what I have. I'm a nomad missionary at this time, Paul's writing. I'm going city to city. I'm basically homeless, and I'm just on a rescue mission helping people take their next step with Jesus, and I'm content with whatever I have. I've learned this. Matter of fact, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything, Paul says. I've learned the secret of living in every situation. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ, who gives me strength. Paul knew what it was like to have a lot. Matter of fact, earlier in his life, he was a very successful rabbi. He had a following. He was instructed and mentored by the best of the best. So Paul kind of had a, he had a reputation. He had money. He had it all. He probably most likely, well, he did. He had a family. But when he gave his life to Jesus, Acts chapter 8, he lost everything. And he's experienced the peaks and the valleys. And he declares, no matter the situation, I've learned how to be content. Let me ask you this. Have you learned to be content? Have you learned to be content? Can you say this? Like Paul says, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I I don't need more. It's hard, especially in a spoiled culture like ours, isn't it? It's really hard. It's hard because of the world we live in. It's a, it's a, real, it's a reality for us, a struggle. Another great contentment verse, Hebrews 13, 5, don't love money. Say this with me. Be satisfied with what you have. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. See, when we're content with what we have, we are free from the bondage to materialism and the slavery to materialism. 
which I believe so many in our culture are, are just so in bondage to. Stuff, materialism, money. See, if we're going to spend in a way that honors God, we've got to be content. We've got to be content. So how do you, how do you acquire contentment? We'll go back to your foundation, and, and the foundation is our identity. It, look, if Jesus is really enough for you, you really don't need all the things. Are you with me? I'm speaking to me. I'm preaching to Chris right now. If Jesus is really enough, I don't need all the things and the extras. I need to be content. Why? Because I have an eternal inheritance. I have the Holy Spirit living in me and I have self-control. I don't need all the stuff. He, can, he brings that back. He, he wields that and pulls it back. I don't need all the things. And of course, I am a citizen of heaven and, and everything is there for me. So the first tip to spending is we need to focus on being content. Are you content? Are you content with what you have? Take inventory. Evaluate what you have. Do I have enough? And I would venture to say that everybody in this room and in the theater, online, you have enough. You're blessed. I'm blessed. We have plenty. So if we're going to if we're going to spend in a way that honors God, we've got to focus on contentment. The second tip to biblical spending, you can take the, write this down if you'd like. We've got to be on guard toward temptation. We've got to be on guard toward temptation. We've got to look out for the things that are coming our way. Uh, do you really need that? When you're on social media, this is crazy to me. You take your phone out, you open up your favorite social, whatever it is, maybe your Instagram or uh, TikTok, or I don't even know. There's so many now. There, maybe you're on all of them. If you're on all of them, stop it. Anyway, um, nobody has that type of um, time. But when I go on, this is crazy. When I go on Instagram and I mention something to Penny about a certain item, it pops up on here. It's temptation. That's what that is. Oh, you really want it? You talking about it? You really want it? It's crazy. I could probably say something right now. A brand new Corvette, and I bet in five minutes there'll be a brand new Corvette on sale right here on my Instagram. The temptation's real, my friends. It's everywhere. It's more now than ever before. It's in your pocket, right? It's on your laptop. It's everywhere you go. Temptation is real. And if you and me are going to spend in a way that honors God, we want to be on guard toward temptation, knowing that it's everywhere. The other day... We were, uh, Penny and I were sitting out on our deck, and I, um, I got an email from Banana Republic, okay? And, and on there, 70, you remember this, honey? 70% off of everything. I'm like, oh, let's go, right? Everything? Everything. So I go in, and I'm, I'm scrolling, and I had four items in my, in my, in my bag, in my shopping cart, right? And Penny's like, you going to get them, honey? I was like, oh, I, I don't really need them. I, 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 do you remember this? I don't really need them. I said, you should get something. She's like, I don't really need anything. And it was a real defining moment for us because the temptation was real. Why? Because I was going to save 70%. I was taking money from Banana Republic, right? The temptation was real. And guess what I did? I X'd out of my browser and I didn't buy it. I didn't need it. But it's real. <laughs> One victory, right? One victory. Listen, I know it's real for you too. It may not be Banana Republic, but it's real. And by the way, it's not going away. The temptations are always going to be there. It says in Romans chapter 12, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Watch this. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. A great way to explain this is I, I, there's an, old, an older translation. It's more of like a, a devotional version that says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. 
Don't let the temptations of the world direct you. Don't let the ads drive you. They're going to be, you're going to go home today and you're going to pull, pull up your social media platform, whatever one you prefer, and there will be a temptation there, an ad, something to spend your money on. And I would say, don't let the world squeeze you. Don't let the temptation pull you in. If you're going to spend biblically, we've got to resist the temptations. Don't let the latest Amazon deal tempt you. Which, by the way, it's like they have Prime Day every month now. It used to just be in July. I knew that. Don't let the latest Amazon hot deal pull you in. If we're going to be people who are spending in a way that honors God, we have got to be on guard toward temptation. Remember, you have an eternal inheritance. Remember, you are a citizen of heaven. And remember, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and he bears the fruit of self-control. See, there are thousands of messages that are going to tempt you this week. And I'm just speaking of where your money goes. I'm not talking about other types of temptations. There are plenty. It seems like there are more temptations to pull out of your wallet now than ever before. And as followers of Jesus, we've got to be on guard towards those temptations. Focus on contentment. Guard temptation. And number three, we've got to evaluate our purchases. We've got to evaluate our purchases. And here's some questions to ask that will help you evaluate your purchasing. Can we pay cash or will the purchase put us in debt? That's hard because it's so easy. Guarantee you have a few cards. I can just put it on there. PayPal. They just used to be basically a digital transfer. Now they give you the option, put it on credit. And guess what? You don't even have to pay for it for six months. But in six months, they'll charge you like 50% what you paid for that. But listen, we've got to evaluate the purchases. If we're going to spend in a way that honors God, we want to make sure that we're not putting ourselves deeper into debt. It's one of the great traps in life. Another question you can ask as you evaluate your purchases, do we have complete peace about it? Do we have no doubt? And I say we, couples, maybe you're single. For you, you have to make that decision. Do you have complete peace about it? Is there no doubt? Romans 14 says, if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something or spend on something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. I can't stand the Bible sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Why do you have to be so straight up, Bible? Why can't you like sound flowery like the Proverbs or something? For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are what? Ouch. That includes spending. I'm telling you, this, heart, this hurts. Makes me happy I didn't buy the Banana Republic stuff the other day. <laughs> we need to watch our tendency to rationalize because we're really good at that, aren't we? We rationalize really good. Well, you know, I could really use it. I was just looking at new raincoats because it's rained so much this summer up in New England. And my, the one I currently have is 10 years old and I was like, it's got a lot of rain usage out of it. It still works really good. I don't need another one but I rationalize it. It's rained a lot. It's put its use in. It's time to retire. No, it's just a jacket. Let it take more rain. We've got to give ourselves um, this opportunity to evaluate our purchases. We can't be so flippant. Another question to ask in this, in this vein is, is it a real need? Or... Here you go. Is it a matter of greed? Is it need or greed? And a lot of times, our, our, the things we're spending our money on 
is really just greed. It's just getting more, accumulating another. It says in 1 Timothy, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are what? Say it again. Are trapped by fool, many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. So the, the question, is it real? Is it a real need or is it just a matter of greed? Will it be profitable for our family? Will, will it enhance my spiritual growth? Will it, will it help me become healthier? Will it, it, will it help me serve more in my church and engage further in the rescue mission? Or it will take me away from these things? These are valid questions that we should be asking. Is it, is it going to put tarnish on God's reputation from my life? I remember... This is, this is Chris being really honest. In August of 2009, I, there was this like a season in our life. It's just like, I, Penny knows this, holy discontent. It was just like not content where we were. We were living in South Florida, right? And I had this boat. You remember the boat? I had this little 15-foot, it was a 1966 hull, old boat, aluminum hull, and it had a 90 Merc on it, and we had to put sandbags in the front of the boat to keep it from flying up. True story. And so I'd take this boat out. Do you remember this, honey? She hated going on this boat because I'd fly, you know, in South Florida. That's what you do. And my boat, the motor died. It, it broke. And so I was like, guess what, babe? It's time for a new boat. And we didn't just go look for another replacement, a used boat. It's like we were driving in this one town that was known for selling boats. We happened to drive through the town. <laughs> and we left that day with a brand new boat. And if you're familiar with boats, they're money pits. <laughs> and I, I, there's, I didn't really need it. We didn't need it. We didn't need the boat. Probably just needed a, a replacement for that old one. We probably needed a 1967 and not a 66, right? But we didn't ask that question. Was it a matter of need? It was just like, ah, oh, we just want it. It was kind of a greedy thing. The irony was, as you well know, it was less than six months later we were up here. And we didn't need that boat. Can I tell you God's grace was all over that because we sold it that next summer for more than what we paid for it. Praise the Lord. He had grace. And that's a beautiful thing in this space because we're his kids. We're, we're his children. He loves us. And we, we, can, we can have greed and, and, and mess up and he can say, okay, you're my kid. I'm gonna, since you've relented and given this over to me, I'm going to take care of you. Listen, when we spend our money, we want to make sure we're seeking to honor God with it. He's blessed us with it. And so we got to ask that question, is it a real need or is it a matter of greed? 1 Timothy 5 says, those who don't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Here's what happens. Because we spend irrationally and we're not considering uh, spending in a way that honors God, down the road, we don't have the opportunity to be able to take care of those who took care of us. I've seen this happen time and time again. Another question I ask, is our lifestyle adequate or is it more than adequate? Do we need to reduce our spending by lowering our expected standard or comfort? Though, it says in Ecclesiastes, those who love money will never have enough. There you go, Bible. <laughs> How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. There you go, Bible. <laughs> the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. <laughs> Those are the ads, aren't they? So what good is wealth, except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers, says one of the richest men to ever walk the planet, King Solomon. So remember, listen. We want to seek to honor God with how we spend the money that he's provided. In the time we live in where we've walked through those statistics, you're, the money that you're earning is not going as far as it used to. And it's going to require us to spend in a way that is smart and frugal 
And there's no better instruction than God's word on this. And so remember your identity. As you move on in life this week, as you step towards work and all the things that we've even talked about, the ads that are going to pop up, I want you to remember your identity. You have an eternal inheritance. That you should, by the power of the Spirit, exercise self-control and that you are a citizen of heaven. Your identity is in eternity, not here. So here's some next steps for you, and I hope you consider these next steps. I think we all have them. The first next step is this. I want you to consider your spending habits. And I I want you, if you're married, talk to your spouse about this. Does our spending reflect our identity? Does our spending reflect our identity? It's a good question. Remember your identity. We've talked about it throughout, throughout our time together today. Does your spending reflect your identity? That's a great next step I think everybody should take. Here's another next step. You're like, Chris, I feel overwhelmed right now. This is so convicting. I have nothing. I've, I'm up to my eyeballs in debt. I've been caving into the temptations. Can I just tell you there's hope? And we have a great free resource for you. And the resource is Ramsey Plus. And I want you to know that this can change your life. This is a great resource. There's a a code. You need to scan that. And as you scan that, it'll take you right to a page with our church code. And it's free, absolutely free. I believe this is 120 bucks a year if you were to go outside. We're giving it to you. This is budgeting. These are tools. Here's something that comes with Ramsey Plus that is incredible. There are groups right now that are meeting via digital groups that you can jump right in. You're like, I just need someone to be around me to help me. Jump into a Ramsey Plus group right here, right now. It's free. That's the next step. If you don't have this, do it now. Claremont, do it. White River, do it. It's free. It's a great step for you to better get a hold of your spending and better spend and spend in a way that honors God. And then maybe you need prayer. Some of y'all are like, I need a lot of prayer on this one, Chris. Well, we want to pray with you because we're a house of prayer. This is what we do. And so after our experience in Claremont and White River, we have a prayer team that would love to join you in praying. Maybe you have a specific financial prayer that you want to Uh, have someone come alongside and pray with you on, we would love to do that with you. But I believe we all have a next step. And I hope you would consider it. Another next step, and this is it. Are you ready? Everybody right here. Come back next week. Come back next week. That's the next step. Here's why. Next week, we're going to, we've we've asked the question, how can I spend better, right? Like, how do I spend better? We we address that today. Next week, we're going to say, well, how can I be generous? Because you realize, as Christians in our identity, we are, Christian means Christ follower or little Christ. He's the most generous who's ever lived, isn't he? And so how can we be like Jesus? How can we be generous? You don't want to miss next week. But I think we all have a step to take, and I'd encourage you to take it. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much that you speak to us. That you give us instruction, you give us clarity, you, you give us the ability by the power of your spirit and through the instruction of your word to be able to make good decisions and to have guidance and instruction so that we can correct bad decisions. And so I pray that we would be a people that are honest with ourselves and with you about the steps that we need to take, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And, you know, I just talked about the generosity of, of Jesus. We're talking about spending. We're talking about identity. This is all connected to one single narrative. And that single narrative is the story of you and God. All of this is connected to you and God. And maybe you came in here today, you're watching online, and you feel far from God. Like maybe you're, I don't even know if God exists. I'm just that far. Well, the Bible says something really interesting. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. Everybody 
has sinned means everybody has done wrong things, has missed the mark. We've lied, we've cheated. According to the scripture we read today, when you spend something that you know you shouldn't spend and you do it anyway, that's sin, that's wrongdoing. We're all guilty. I'm guilty, you're guilty, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. Watch this. God is holy and perfect and magnificent, and you and me are not. And because God is holy and you are not, there's a natural break in relationship between you and me and us and God. Our sin causes us to have a chasm, a void, a gorge, if you will, that separates us from God. That's what sin does. But sin is also way bigger than that. Maybe you're here today and you're like, yeah, you kind of read my mail. I feel far from God. That's, well, that's what sin does, but it's bigger. Here's how it's bigger. God created you and me in his image. He created you and me in his image. And this is what it simply means, that you have eternity drawn upon your heart. I do too. We have eternity drawn upon our heart. One day, this life will end for you, and you will spend eternity somewhere. You are created in the image of God. God is eternal, and so are you. The scripture says this, for the wages of sin is death. So the whole idea that everybody's a sinner, everybody's done wrong things, and every one of us is going to live forever because we're eternal, this scripture that says, for the wages of sin is death, has incredible implications. And here's what it is. Without our sin removed, without our sin taken away by God and removed, and without us being made right by him, we would go into eternity, which by the way, you will die one day. That's a guarantee of life, right? You're going to die. I'm going to die. And when you die, when this life ends, you won't just cease to exist. You won't just go into the ground and rot. No, you have eternity written upon your heart and you will spend eternity somewhere. And according to scripture, when you die without your sins forgiven and removed by God, without being made right with him, you will spend eternity separated from God in a literal place called hell. That is a serious problem. So you mean to tell me, Chris, I'm a sinner? I'm going to die one day. And when I die, if my sins aren't forgiven by God and removed by him, I will spend eternity in a real place called hell. Yes. And that's a problem. And that's, that's where hope comes in. There's hope. As hopeless as that sounds, there's hope. And the hope comes in this. The Bible says this. For God so loved the world. There's so much hope in that. For God so loved the sinful jacked up world. Put your name in there. For God so loved Chris, sinful me. For God so loved me that he sent his one and only son, Jesus. He sent his son, Jesus, to live 33 sinless years so that he could go to a Roman cross and pay the price for your sins and my sins. For God so loved me that he sent his son to take my sins and your sins upon him to pay the price that I could never pay in religion or morality. No, Jesus is the one who took my sins. Listen, Jesus is the solution to our sin problem. And here's how I know this. He was buried after he hung on that cross and died. And when he was buried, he sat there and the authorities thought it was finished and over, never to be heard from again. But that was far from the truth because three days later, Jesus conquered death and hell and rose from the grave. And he sits in eternity waiting for you and me to come into heaven. But here's the thing. As much as Jesus is the solution to our sin problem, he is the answer that we're all looking for. If we don't do something about it, it doesn't matter. If you don't do something about that, if you don't make a decision, if you don't take a step towards Jesus and believe in him, that's a serious consequence that you'll pay. So I'm here today to say that God loves you, 
that he sent his son Jesus to die for you, that he rose from the grave. And the Bible says that if you believe on him, your sins will be forgiven and you will be marked for eternity in heaven. Jesus Christ is the solution to our sin and hell problem. And my question for you is this, do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Um, I'm not asking if you know about him. I'm asking if you know him. There's a big difference between information and relationship. So with every head bowed online and in the house, every eyes closed, if you're here today and you're like, Chris, I want to believe today. I want my sins forgiven. I want to receive this beautiful gift that you speak of, of everlasting life in heaven through forgiveness through Jesus Christ. I, I want a relationship with God. I want to be made right today. How do I do it? Well, here's how it works. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to invite you, whether you're online or in the house, to boldly raise your hand to say, yes, Chris, I want to believe today. So let me count to three. One, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, believe and you will be rescued. Two, today is the day that you can believe. Today. You can believe today. And if that's you, three, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Chris, I want to believe today. I want to say yes to Jesus today. Just quietly raise your hand right where you are. If you're online, just raise your hand. It's the most important decision you have ever or will ever make. So here's the thing. You have your hand up. You're online. You're in the house. Here's what I want you to do. If you're in the house, I want you to look at the end of your aisle, and I have a friend I want to connect you with, and they're going to help you better understand what it is to follow Jesus. If you're online, here's what I want you to do. I want you to know, first of all, I'm really proud of you, and I want you to go ahead and text the words, respond now to the number 94,000. And when you do that, one of our team will connect with you right away and will help you better understand what it is to follow Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for instructing us. Thank you for giving us tools so that we can navigate life in a way that is effective. And I pray, God, that we would be a people that would be a shining light even in our spending with how we conduct ourselves with the resources that you've given us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message has encouraged you and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. And if you want to stay up to date on new messages every week, be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified anytime we put up a new video. Here at Riverbank, we are on a rescue mission to reach people with the message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, you can go to riverbankchurch.com forward slash give or click on the giving link in the description. We love you and we're praying for you. We'll see you next week.